That's an amazing result. You say, well, uh, there's no charge inside. Still an amazing result. Because it means that anywhere inside here, no matter what radius you choose, the electric field equals exactly zero. And it means there is some crazy conspiracy of all these charges that are uniformly distributed here, which each individually contribute to the electric field inside through Coulomb's law, that all those together, through a conspiracy, make the E field everywhere inside zero. It's a non-trivial result. All right, so now we know that the E field inside is zero. So this is for R smaller than R. Let's now go R larger than R. Everything I told you holds for the sphere, which is outside this hollow sphere. Everything holds. The E field here must be the same everywhere on the surface. The A and E are either parallel or anti-parallel. So I can write down again that 4 pi R squared, which is the surface area, times the electric field vector, must be the Q inside divided by epsilon zero. But this Q is that Q. It's not zero. There is charge inside. And so now I know that the electric field E, in terms of its magnitude, is Q divided by 4 pi R squared epsilon zero. And we know the direction. If it is positive, of course, it is radially outwards. And if this is negative, it's radially inwards. And this is a non-trivial result. We have seen this before. If I had put all the charge right here at the middle, at the center, we would have gotten exactly the same answer. We've seen that before. In other words, whether the charge is uniformly distributed over a sphere, or whether the charge is all of it exactly at the center of the sphere, that makes no difference for the E field as long as you're outside the sphere. If you plot the electric field as a function of R, and if here is capital R, and if this is the, the field strength, then you would get that the electric field is zero inside, jumps to a maximum value, and this falls off as 1 over R squared, proportional to 1 over R squared. If I go back to the situation that the charge, that the electric field inside is zero, you may say, isn't that a little bit of a cheat? Because, yeah, there is no charge inside, but have you really used the charge outside? And if you have used it, how did you use it? Well, I have used it. I use it through my symmetry arguments. The symmetry arguments take into account that the charge is uniformly distributed. If the charge on the sphere had not been uniformly distributed, I could not have used the symmetry argument, and therefore the electric field inside would in fact not have been zero. If there is more charge on the sphere here than there is there, the field inside the sphere is not zero. So I have used all that charge by using my symmetry argument. Gauss's law and Coulomb's law, in a way, are the same law. They both link the electric field with the charge Q. Key is the fact that the electric force falls off as 1 over R square. If the electric field strength did not fall off as 1 over R square, Gauss's law would not even hold. And the electric field inside this uniformly charged sphere would not be zero. So it is the immediate consequence of the fact that electric forces fall off as 1 over r squared. Gravitational forces also fall off as 1 over r squared. Therefore, if you take a planet, if it existed, which is a hollow spherically, spherical planet but hollow inside, it means there would be no gravitational field inside that hollow planet. So if you were there, there would be no gravitational force on you, if it is spherical. If that planet were a cubical planet, then 
the gravitational field inside would not be zero. You say, well, big deal with 801, we always take a planet, and then as far as we're outside the planet, we put all the mass and we consider it as a point. Yeah, indeed. It's not a big deal for you, and it is not a big deal for me, but it was a big deal for Newton. He intuitively sensed that it was correct that if you have a planet of uniform mass distribution, that you can consider it as a point mass, as long as you're outside the planet. But it took him 20 years to prove it, and he finally published his results. It would take us now 30 seconds. He didn't have access to Gauss' law came about 100 years later. But the net result is that you see here in front of you that if you have uniformly charged distribution and you can draw the parallel with gravity, that it's, you get the same electric field outside that you would have gotten if all the charge is at one location, at the center. This is spherical symmetry number one. That's the easiest symmetry that we have in 802. Now I will present you with a second form of symmetry, which is a flat horizontal plane. And I want you to work out most of it, but I'll help you a little bit to set it up. Suppose we have a plane which is very, very large. Think of it for now as infinitely large. It doesn't exist, of course, infinitely large. And I put on this plane charge. And I put a certain amount of charge density, which I call sigma. Sigma is an amount of charge Q per area A. So it is a certain number of coulombs per square meter. And it's uniformly distributed, so the whole plane everywhere has the same number of coulombs per square meter, or micro coulombs, or nano coulombs, whatever you prefer. And this is a plane which is huge, and you are being asked, what is the electric field anywhere in space? Just like we before, we ask, what is the electric field anywhere inside the sphere and anywhere outside the sphere? Now I want to know what it is anywhere in the vicinity of this plane. If now you pick a clever Gauss surface, the answer pops out very quickly. If you would choose a sphere as a Gauss surface, you're dead in the waters, you get nowhere because there's no spherical symmetry. I will define for you that Gauss surface, but I want you to work out at home how you get the electric field. Suppose I want to know what the electric field is at a distance d above the plane. What I do now is I choose this as my Gauss surface. Watch me closely. This is the intersection with the plane. This is my Gauss surface. It is a closed surface. Three conditions have to be met for you to be able to calculate what the E vector is at that location D. 